when I was at university, they mentioned how, you know, in ancient times, they used to have hand signals. And I'm like, wait, 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 it wasn't ancient times. No, no, I've no, seen it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it in the 20th yeah. century. Shalom and welcome to Hebrew Voices. I'm here today with a practicing scribe, Mark Michaels, a.k.a. Mordechai Pinchas. Shalom, Mark. Uh, Mordechai, how are you? I'm fine. Shalom, Nam. Yeah, lovely to see you again. Now, last time I spoke to you, you were uh, working as a scribe, a Jewish scribe who repairs Torah scrolls, writes the scroll of Esther, and now you've actually, I'm going to say you've, you've You've gone up a level in your in your qualifications. Gone to the dark side. When you you, re, you really um, we're here at Cambridge University, and you're a PhD um, student at, at Cambridge University. Is that right? Yes, uh, I'm currently doing a part time PhD. I'm actually their first, as far as I understand, part timer, um, mm -hmm. doing uh, work around Sefer Tagin. Uh, I think I might have mentioned that last time. Um, um, and we'll talk um, about Sefer yep, Tagin later. Under I mean, Jeffrey yeah. Kahn and Ben Althwaite. So okay, wow. Jeffrey Kahn and, and so you've got the big hitters there. Yep, absolutely. So, okay, so um, you mentioned to me that here at the university you have uh, something that we don't really have a parallel to in, in the U.S. or Israel, your, your status as a... Yeah, this this term, apparently I was, and I didn't really understand what it was at all, because um, having coming slightly from the side as opposed to uh -huh. the standard academic trail, uh, I, I was awarded senior scholar status. For, so you're a senior scholar. For, ac for academic achievement, wow. uh, excellent academic achievement. That was very nice. And you're a senior scholar at Cambridge University. That's so cool. So apparently that is the case. I, how, how did it means I can wear a gown at the high table, apparently. You know, I don't even know what that means. You but. know, I, I, was, I was walking to breakfast the other day i'm staying at one of the colleges they call them um and there were these um people walking around with these like and i'm just going to call it what it is harry potter outfits yes and i asked somebody like do they make you wear that every day they're like no we're graduating today <laughs> yeah well no you you are supposed to wear them at formal dinners apparently okay. uh, i've not been to one um and uh and uh, apparently, if I'd got senior scholar status, I think it's at Trinity, then I'm allowed to walk on the scholar's lawn, but only really? if I'm wearing my full robes. Uh, okay. I don't, again, I have no idea if any of this is true. Uh, it's just something that happened this term, and I was like, this okay. is interesting. I have no idea yeah. what it means. So senior scholar at Cambridge, but you told me that uh, before we started that you actually didn't start out in academia that you almost sort of fell into it. So. Uh, completely by accident. So, tell me um, about that. so I'm a graphic designer by trade. Mm -hmm. I'm actually yeah. a marketing director full time okay. uh, in a London agency. But back then I was a graphic designer mm -hmm. um, and I was designing um, leaflets and posters and websites mm -hmm. and stuff like that really early on for, um, for, for lots of Jewish organizations, including one, which was the Leah Beck College. Um, which, oh, which trains well, which okay. trains rabbis in this country. Um, okay. My dad actually, my dad and I actually got an MA exactly the same time because huh. uh, wow. he was training to be a rabbi and I was doing the MA. But the reason I fell into the MA was purely on on the fact that I was designing the leaflet to tell people about the MA, <laughs> and I was reading the copy <laughs> thinking. I do this for fun. This is this is this is. Uh, I'm, I'm that geeky that I look at this stuff for fun. I could get an MA, That's wow. all, which is a master's degree. Yeah, which is what I, said. I could get an MA. Yeah. So I so I applied um, from my own leaflet that I designed, uh, and then it was a very effective it, it was leaflet. All, it was all it was extremely <laughs> good marketing, basically, uh, and then it was going really, 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 really well up until the last day before the interview, where they said, "Oh, and by the way, you have to do an exam," and I went. What? I said, well, you, you haven't been in college for, for a while. We, mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to understand how good you are at Hebrew and your mm -hmm. biblical knowledge and blah, blah, blah. And they said, and, and I said, oh, okay, so when? They said, oh, tomorrow. <laughs> okay. And I went, oh, oh, I get no notice to revise, prepare, <laughs> what, what, just turn up. How many years had it been since you'd been to like formal schooling? Uh, oh, a good three or four since okay. I'd actually done any proper hard no studying okay uh, and then suddenly i was doing an exam the next day which i wow. which i did okay on although the guy who was marking it was quite strict uh, but then when he was told that i had had less than 24 hours notice he went oh he did quite well then <laughs> um so yeah that was that was okay and so yeah. i i got through and i mm -hmm. was the first um person through that their ma program um and uh didn't really think much of it. Um, mm. Obviously graduated at the same time as my dad, which was mm. 
different. Wow. Uh, there's photos of both of us in our robes. Uh, and then didn't really worry about it at all until this opportunity came up where I was, I, again, I could do a PhD. This is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went around and people were like, this is very niche. Um, not sure if we can help you, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually I came across Ben, who, mm -hmm. Dr. Ben Althwaite, who I'd actually had some dealings in the past because mm -hmm. I'd used some of the Geniza material in a couple of books. Uh, and, and he's the head of the, what's he's the, head Geniza, of the Geniza, Geniza, Research, Geniza Research, Research Unit yeah. at Cambridge University Library. And he... Um, I basically uh, came in to see him and Professor Jeffrey Kahn and convinced them that it was worth taking a risk to take on a, uh, a, a part-time student. Apparently they had to go and talk to the powers that be. And, okay. uh, but I'd done a lot of research, yeah. which eventually turned into my book on Sefet Agin that's out mm -hmm. there now. And uh, so they could see that yeah. I was and, serious. And that's an interesting, um, we'll talk about your book, um, making little notes for myself. It's interesting though this whole thing at Cambridge University because I, I had when I was looking to do my PhD I looked at a bunch of schools and one of them I looked at was Cambridge and they said well you know yeah you could definitely get in no problem but you'd have to live here for three years and that's that's an absolute hard requirement yep. and you can't and you can't have another job it has to be your full time thing for three years and I said well that's a non starter for me <laughs> well part of this but they actually let you well uh, do it so so part of this was and and they're one hundred percent correct. Mm -hmm. but, that you don't feel like you're necessarily part of the student body, and yes, you're mm -hmm. unless you're here. As it happens, mm -hmm. even if I'd been full time because of COVID, yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't have been part of the student body anyway. So, well, you would have been that, but they're all isolated. But, but they're so. all isolated. So yeah. the reality was, that, uh, mm -hmm. part being a part timer hasn't been quite as bad, and now the world has changed. I yeah. think people have recognised that that's yeah. perfectly feasible. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the things that's different about Cambridge. Correct me if I'm wrong here. So at most universities in, let's say, in the U.S. or Israel, you've a certain in the U.S. it's even more so. You have a certain amount of coursework you have to do, and and I've been told Not, that Cambridge no, no coursework. There's for no courses, PhD, which is wonderful. Okay. It's just wow. research. It's pure research. Although wow. again, that can be quite daunting because yeah. you're mostly on your own, yeah. and you're mostly so it's it's great to come here in 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 real mm -hmm. um and and meet with colleagues and talk and bounce ideas mm -hmm. and, and also look at the manuscripts in uh, i've got a blog coming out on the geniza um website shortly well actually i have no idea when it's going to come out but it will come out uh, so you've written an article for the, it's, the geniza I've research written a, i've, I've yeah. written an article about the importance of seeing manuscripts in real okay um and with some examples and it was going to be a paper and it may well turn out to be a paper mm -hmm. presentation as well but it, it literally some of the examples of things where if you if you just look at it digitally you you don't get the whole story can you please tell this to all the librarians because i've been to some libraries i will tell it to every where, library i've been to world. libraries where they say you don't need to see that we have color photos on the no, website it doesn't and, and and their color photos are sometimes are amazing sometimes they're not as good as what i can do on my iphone um and and what i find is i'll spend a lot of time studying photos and then I need to go in and see it. But I'm not looking at everything. I'm looking at specific things where I'm like, I'm not sure what that is. I'm not exactly sure about that. I don't know what the different shades of color are there. I need to go see it for myself. So I've, I've uh, written a fragment of the month for the Geniza mm -hmm. unit around. A... Tell everybody what that is because they don't know what that is. What, what's the what's this blog that, of which you speak? Um, so, so there's well, there's a blog and there's also a thing called fragment of the month where okay. they pick okay, up somebody finds something of interest in the fragment okay. and then they'll talk about what they've found, and usually the ones that are is, unidentified. So this is Cambridge University's Geniza, Geniza unit. Research Unit. They have Fragment of the Month. Fragment okay. of the Month. So you've written one of those. So I've written one of those, oh, okay. um, and it's around a, a piece that I found which was around cantillation, so the trope. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Tamim, so, okay. as they're called in Hebrew. Okay, so that's interesting. There's three different terms for this. In Yiddish, we call it trop or trope. In, uh, I always called it trop. In Hebrew, it's called tamim or tamimika, and in English, they'll also often refer to it as accent, mar accent, accent marks. marking or cancellation right. marks. Or cancellation marks. And yeah. accent isn't really exactly right yeah, because no. it's more than accent. The um, cancellation is not the full story either. The, so, so okay. what I've found, and it's yeah. slightly different to mm -hmm. many of the. So there are listings of the different yeah. notes, um, and each of those fragments are, are interesting in their own respect but this one was mm -hmm. particularly interesting because it was clearly a kind of trope trainer mm -hmm. uh, and oh, it really? was it was a little fragment been written by a teacher to teach a student wow so they'd, he'd taken little excerpts of verses and oh, made wow. sure that he covered off most of the note i think pretty much all of the notes i think soft pursuit was missing mm -hmm. um 
and and so it, and he'd written it out really nicely oh. and and written the names of the notes on the top next oh, to so the cool. notes and it was a it was obviously a teaching thing mm -hmm. so um and uh the the Ganesi unit had hadn't seen anything like that before. They hadn't mm. stumbled across this one, so I wrote about what was different about that particular cool. one. So that's awesome. And, and obviously, as someone who who lanes Torah in a synagogue, so actually um, does tell them, tell them what lane means. Laning is is reading but with chanting. Okay. So you read the Torah with and it has no vowels and it has no notes. So you actually have to remember them. Yeah. Um, and it has them in like the printed book, but in the actual in, Torah, in the actual scroll, Torah scroll, it doesn't have. It's literally okay. the consonants. So when you're laning, mm -hmm. uh, and I. It was last week I did Shishi, which is the sixth call up. Can, can you recite a portion of that, like off top? Your like I don't know a few a few words or something. Um, or? Well, I can I can sing. I, so I can sing you the, uh, the, the kind of normal things you get. You, for example, you get Ma pa pashta zakev katan zakev gadol mecha tipcha mecha sof pasuk, mm. which is an Ashkenazi trope. Yeah. Um, and that's a fairly standard kind of lilt mm. to the to the to the reading. Is there a passage you know by heart that you can do with that? Or, uh, no, no, here? no. I don't. I don't Fair tend enough. to re okay. remember stuff because you sort of like uh -huh. you, either either you do it with a little bit of notice okay, or you do it on the day and you may have to make up some of it because because okay. uh, <laughs> you're not sure of everything that's there. Um, I know at my bar but, mitzvah there were people holding their hands over their ears because I can't carry a tune. Yeah, but. so there were, in, in last week, Sedra, on the shishi, there were two pazers. Mm -hmm. So pazer, um, which is, you know, and that was on Ve'im and, uh, and I think Ha'isha. Um, so, and if, and the woman. Um, and they used to have hand signals. Mm -hmm. But they don't do the, that anymore. No, I've seen the hand and signals. I would love to have hand signals because if somebody had the hand signals, yeah. then I wouldn't have to so, so let's explain this. it so much. I saw this in the 80s in Chicago. I was at a synagogue and there was somebody standing on the side doing these hands. I'm like, what is this? And they explained to me yeah. each one is one, represent, each symbol represents one of the different uh, uh, trope or accent marks. Mm. And the person who's reading, He's, he sees the words in front of him, and he's reminded of which accent is on that word or that set of words. Uh, and I'm like, this is incredible. And, and years later, I when I was at university, they mentioned how, you know, in ancient times, they used to have hand signals. And I'm like, wait, 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 it wasn't ancient times. No, no, I've no, seen it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it in the 20th century, yeah, yeah. and I don't know if people still do it. I'm sure somebody yeah, still no, does some, it. Some people still do it. So it's incredible it. that, that what was written down, as far as we know, by the Masoretic scribes, had existed in the form of these hand signals at some point, and maybe another point just in the form of a tune or a way of chanting, or, or, um, or as one scholar argues, prosody, uh, meaning like it's, it's, yeah, it, it's that's what I said too. It, it's basically what she explained um, uh, as a lecture she gave at SBL um, that um, it's just like every language has kind, of, and I might be misexplaining it, but or mis, you know, basically how every language has sort of like a sing song to it, a cadence. Cadence, a sing song, um, uh, intonation in a sense, maybe, and, and she didn't use that word, she used prosody, so I, I want to get this right. But basically, that this recorded those those speech patterns. And so, and 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 what's attractive about her explanation is that so we have this whole system of, of what the accents do and how they interpret, uh, they combine certain sets of words and break apart other words, but how would anybody know that hearing it? Right. I mean, well, it, I mean, the whole idea and why it's called tamim, which mm -hmm. means taste, flavor. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to give you a flavor of yeah. a feel of the word more than just the sense of. Well, the but word. tamim could also mean uh, reasons or meanings. It can also mean right? so, reasons. So, so, so it was the way they read it conveyed meaning. Yes. Right. And, and look, there's this famous example where there's this one sentence with seven words that can mean seven different things. I don't remember what it is, but basically, you know, it's something like, um, uh, you know, uh, um, I don't. Know, it's, it depends on the word that you emphasize that can change the whole meaning of but the sentence. You can sentence. do that in English. If, if you yeah, absolutely. Well, you do it in every language. Every that language. was her point. That yeah. is part of the natural patterns of language, and no one's ever attempted to explain the ta'amim, the accent marks, the, the trump in that way. And so she's trying to figure out, okay, how does this apply to that now that we have these terms and well, I suspect some of them might be 
some of the things like Pazet, for example, yeah. might be sarcasm or yeah. emphasis. Certainly, it's, a, it's really so emphatic. So shall shell it. Is obviously, is emphasis, right? Yeah. Vait ma me. Ah, yeah. ah, exactly. Okay, that one I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually did lane. I, I read from the Torah a few years ago. I, I did it once at my bar mitzvah, and it, it was it was horrible. It was horrible <laughs> because I didn't understand. I came from a family where nobody sang. My father would sing Shabbat songs on on Shabbat, and we would cut, we we would say, "Dad, please stop! It hurts to hear you," because he couldn't carry a tune. And then the rabbi tried to explain to me like Ravia, like a rising tone, mm -hmm. and I'm like, "Do I stand up as I'm saying it?" Like I literally didn't understand what he was saying. And um, and and then I decided when I was about five years ago, I said, "You know, now that I understand a little bit better about music theory, I don't know all that much." I said, I, I want to go and I want to actually, you know, read from the Torah. And I started going to the synagogue every Shabbat. And one Shabbat, they said, we have no one to read, you know, Shlishi or whatever it was. And I'm like, I will do it. And I was, I was so nervous. And, um, and I got up there to read from, this was a conservative synagogue uh, in, in Dallas. I got up there and this guy pulls out a book and he says, you know, if you don't know it, you can read it from the book. I'm like, no, I, I prepared it and I can do it. And I did it. I mean. Did, did, like did it hurt people's ears? Maybe, <laughs> but I but I, I was able to do it, um, and I'm like, okay, that's off the checklist, I, you know. Uh, it's kind of, and I I want to say it was my bar mitzvah portion, but I, I don't know. This was like five years ago, so I don't remember. Probably wasn't. So no, I think it was something in Devarim, and my bar mitzvah portion was Vayishlach. So All right. well um, done. I'm still traumatized by that. <laughs> anyway. so so, yeah. so so you found a text that that teaches children. How to do trap, and hopefully it was better than the rabbi who tried to teach me. Because well, I hope so. Yeah, because I mean, he never explained it. And really he obviously well. taken some care to find the verses that had yeah. all of the different oh, uh, cool. notes on there, um, and it's tiny, and mm. it was written. How did you find it? I, I just stumbled across it. Okay, that's how it uh, happens. That's the thing. Often, it was it? literally because you're always looking for yeah. stuff. You okay. stumble across other stuff that you weren't yeah. expecting to stumble across. Right. Um, and I was in looking in real. Yeah. flipping through the yeah. the folders with the different manuscripts in yeah. and I went oh this is interesting because I recognize the the notes and I, I haven't seen anything like that before that's really interesting obviously so do they look like it, the notes that we have today or do they look like the notes like in the Lepo Codex they're or? similar to today but they're not exactly the same and okay. they have different names that's the oh, thing so like, give me an example Oh, uh, that, that, that'll be in the article. Okay, that'll be in the article. Enough. So there's, there's a lot of different names because a lot of them are actually in Arabic. So I had to get oh, wow. uh, Professor Khan and Ben to help me on that one because okay. I have no Arabic whatsoever. Okay. Uh, Aramaic, fine, but Arabic, yeah. no. Uh, and some of them were Aramaic and some of them were the Hebrew. And so it was a oh, real wow. mixed bag yeah. of different I was really things. shocked when I moved to Israel and I found out that not everybody calls it Nachta, Nachta. No. Right, like, like you know, the Sephardim will call it Etnach. Well, you I'm just like, called it Ravi, Ravi, uh -huh, Ravia. and I call it Ravi. Okay. Because that's what I learned. Oh, interesting. So it, 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 okay. everybody has slightly different pronunciations. Yeah. And then I found out different. from between Ashkenazim, and Sephardim, and Yemenite, there's like different names yep, for these. Different names. There's uh, not completely different. Like a lot of them are like Etnach and Etnach are just two forms of the same thing. Well, I think but... Munach in this particular manuscript was Shofar. Oh, wow. Because it looks like a little mini Shofar. Okay. So, um, all, all completely different names. Wow. Were any of these? In, well, okay. Let, let's move anyway, on. That's, let's move on because that's no, that, that'll that's, come out. Soon. Yeah, well, it's good. Yeah, so, so people can read this on the yeah, yeah, Geniza yeah, Research people, Unit, Cambridge people University. People should go to we'll the throw up a link website. When it comes out. Um, there's lots of stuff on there all the time. Okay. And then you mentioned something about a blog. You also do, did something in the blog for the Geniza. So Research the, the Unit? blog is 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 about. Well, the blog that's currently being edited is is around um, why it's so important to go and see the manuscripts okay, in reality, just to see what it's what it's on. You know, mm -hmm. so actually that particular one was on paper and it was rag mm -hmm. paper. I could tell because oh, of the wow. fibers. Yeah. See the size. I had to go and measure it because there was no measurements on the thing. And one of the, I mean, one of the most important finds that I've had, which is which was mm -hmm. the core of the book for the Sefer Tagin. Because I first came across it on a screen, mm -hmm. I had no sense of its scale. Whereas when I saw it in this office, on that desk, um, it's actually quite tiny. It's a notebook. Oh, but wow. I thought it was this massive manuscript, but it's not. It's, it's literally a scholar's notebook. So, so I have a great story about scale. So I, I was looking at this one manuscript. Um, it's a Hebrew translation of, like, in the New Testament epistle of James, I want to say. And it's part, it belonged to King Henry VIII. 
and it, it's called like Royal something or another. Like it's, it's part of the, the Royal collection because it was personally his, his copy. And I had assumed because it, it had the word Royal in it, that it was this massive thing. And I get to the British library a few years ago and it's, it like fit in my hands. It was literally, you know, something somebody maybe would put in his pocket when he was traveling, um, probably maybe even a curiosity. And then it tells that, you what it was used for and how it was used. Well, yes and no. Actually, Meaning, like part of it, part of me thinks maybe it was just a you know curios, you know mm -hmm. curiosity. Like you have these little Torah scrolls that are maybe you could talk about that. The curiosity Torah scrolls. No, I don't know if anybody ever read from these, right? The no, ones that are like this I big. To, no, unless right. I was doing this, you know? right? Like, you've seen those, right? Yeah, well, they yeah. have one at Memorial Scrolls Trust that you've worked at as well. Um, what were those for? Do you know anything about those? That. I mean, they're probably personal travel scrolls because okay. rabbis would go from community to community and they would take them with them partly to study and so partly to use if the, if the community didn't have a Torah. Okay. Uh, one, yeah. of, one of my friends in, in Canada, he is a rabbi and he moves around communities and he has a small Torah. Mm -hmm. There was there was another one. That's interesting. So even today they're doing even that. Even today. And, yeah. and, so that's really interesting. So it's something you could throw in your, in your saddle bag or something like that. Um, what, what is uh, the Frisco Kid? Frisco Kid. He it's had the one... Frisco Kid. Right? No, but this is much smaller than that. Yeah. Right. This is a Torah scroll. It's literally like this big, and you look close, and you're like, and I was surprised. There's one in Oxford I looked at, and it has like corrections. I'm like, how'd they even know there was a mistake? It's so small. Because they do. It's. It's. I mean, it's also for for study. Because yeah. we we study from a Chumash. Mm -hmm. But they studied. No, but these were relatively scrolls. modern. This oh, might have okay, been like that's interesting. This might have been like seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth century. Somebody once told me that they would give these like as a gift to the Tsar when he came to a Jewish village or something. Uh, possible. Um, so, certainly, in some in some communities, they would. So, I, so one of my books is is one of my children's books it's called The Empty Torah, and it's about. Wait, you, so you've written books and children books for children. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's teenagers actually, but I've written a book. Okay. I've written some children's books and illustrated okay. them as well. So there's a book called The Empty the Torah. The Empty that Torah. So The Empty Torah is based on the Megillat Syracusa. And that story is about when the, ki the king would come yeah. to, the vi to the village to show honor to him, they would bring out the Sifri Torah and they would parade them in front of him. Okay. But actually, one year, the, the sages decided mm. that. He, he shouldn't get that honor because he's just he's just a non-Jewish king. No, he's okay. king. So we're not going to put the Torah. We're just going to take the empty cases, the the uh -huh. tick, uh, or you say teak, the yeah. tick, which is this upright thing, which is what I read from in in our synagogue because it's a Sephardi community. So wait, like, that's important. We should explain that. So today, most Torah scrolls that we see, they're wrapped in a they're mail, wrapped in they're velvet. In, yeah, they're, they're, but in the Sephardic world, they're put in Yemenite. what's called a teak or a tick or yeah. Yemenite, and that's a bo a wooden box. It's a wooden box. Yeah. Often with sort of silver and gold yeah. and other things on it, but it can just be a plain wooden box. It's okay. like, um, so they brought, but, out, so the they empty brought out empty ones, right? Okay. And they, but there was a a, a guy who converted, mm -hmm. and he knew that they were faking it, basically, and he told the king, and so the king got really angry, and he mm -hmm. came unexpected to the village. Okay. Uh, but the mm -hmm. prophet Elijah had come to the to the warden of the synagogue the night before, and he told him to fill the cases of the Torah. I need to sort of sleepwalk to the... So i got to stop here. This isn't a story you made up, right? No, no, this, this is, is an actual a, Megillah. A, a medieval this is document. A, this is a Megillah. So there are, there are Purim Ketanim, small Purims. There are many, many different scrolls that have been written by different communities when Jews have been saved from persecution. Okay, and this is something and in Syracuse, is, so in fact, Sicily it, or something? Sicily. Or? So okay. in fact, in Sicily, they've brought this back as a tradition, okay. and they okay. now read a Megillah. And this is, what, a few hundred years old or something? Yeah, um, okay. and they read the Megillah. So, so as far as we know, it's a story that actually happened a few hundred, like yes. five, six hundred years yes. ago or something. Okay, Yeah. so Elijah now, comes maybe, according... Maybe Elijah was not in it, but if well, Elijah, I mean, came, the, Elijah came... Anyway, in some the, way... The way they told the story, the story, Elijah was in it. In the story, they... they i got to stop you there. So you didn't add the Elijah part. That's actually that's Megillah the Megillah Syracuse. Syracuse yeah. Okay, so they claimed Elijah came. Yeah. Okay. So That's so cool. so in effect, they they came. Elijah came, and he and he um, uh, basically told the told the beadle of the synagogue, the warden, to yeah. to fill them. So everybody. So when the king came, 
he said, I would like to see this Torah of Moses. Yeah. Could you open them for me? And he said, oh, these soldiers are all, heavily armed soldiers. And he's thinking, around. gotcha. And he gotcha. The king is thinking. And, and the, the converted guy who's, you know, turncoat, he's, he's going, ah, I've got them now. Um, and uh, and they, they're all petrified. They're, mm. they're absolutely scared living, you know, because they don't know that it's been changed over. Anyway, so he opens, he opens one mm. and there's a scroll inside. And everyone goes, <gasps> And then he opens Wait, so another the one, and the, there's a scroll. So the inside. congregation doesn't know congregation that, doesn't that Elijah know. warned the, the gabai or whoever, yeah, the, 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 gabai, the deacon. Or, yeah. Okay. And and so oh, wow. and he's done this in his sleep, so he's not aware of it either. Oh. Right. And everybody opens the things, and, and scroll after scroll, they're there. And it's okay. a miracle, and everybody's safe, and the king is okay. happy, and the other guy gets hanged. So, wow, so they had some kind of like annual celebration about and this. And then in, they put an annual in, celebration. In but, Sicily. And there are wow. many, many of those. There's, That's pretty cool. I didn't, um, I didn't know that. Mitzrayim, there's a, there's all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, What's Megillat Mitzrayim? Do you know that story? Uh, I, uh, another time. Okay. Another time. Uh, but there's a, there's so a, you wrote a book telling over this story from the Middle Yeah, and, just, okay. uh, and what I did is I did an illustration on the front that was in sort of 15th century um, style of mm. illuminated manuscripts, and then I did wood would pretend woodcuts inside to sort okay. of tell the story and uh That's it was cool. just nice and and eventually i will actually do a, a kind of critical edition of it because um mm. because there are different versions of it flying oh, wow. around so talk about your book since we've last met you have a book that's that was published yes published by brill a very respectable publisher and um it, it's on this safer tagin in fact you know what we're going to do we're going to end this part of the program and in the second part He's going to tell us about Sefer Tagin, about this ancient ancient document, okay. which contains information about letters. And all right, so in the next episode, we will we'll come back. Thank you for joining us. And any final words for this part of the program that you want to share with people? Um, please visit the website if you want to. What's look the website? At, tell the uh, people. Software.co.uk. It's okay. really easy. S o f e r dot co dot uk. Okay. And there's several stories, um, and there's also a Facebook page with uh, videos and stuff about. What's the uh, Facebook page called? Oh, it's Mordechai Pinchas. But uh, okay, we'll put up a link on the yeah. web, the as well dot com. So uh, and right. and there are let's say there's there's videos and pages and lots mm. of photos of the different stories and tales of tales of Torahs, Torah nice. tales. You should make that the name of your website. Tortales. I don't think Tortales should be Tales of Torah. I like that better. Tales but whatever. <laughs> All right, T.O.T., you heard it here. Thank you for joining us. Mark Mordechai, shalom. Hello. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at nehemiaswall.com.